Good afternoon, cybersecurity fam, and welcome back to Black Hat. We're here in fabulous Las Vegas for one of our many shows, but this one is very special. We're here at the largest cybersecurity show in the world, and I am particularly delighted for this next segment because we're going to be digging into threat reports and a lot of the life in cyber for the CISO. Please welcome James to our segment. James, thanks so much for being here with Thank us. Thank you. Happy I can make it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a busy week. This has got to be a busy week for you. You wear a lot of hats this week. Yes. Tell me about those yeah. hats. And tell us a little bit about Netscope, just in case folks aren't aware. Uh, so Netscope been around for about 11 years. Yeah. Uh, I've been here for six. Uh, started as deputy CISO, and now the CISO internally. And really the focus for us is cloud security. Um, all things cloud security, you know, as, as you're a hybrid worker or as you're on-prem, you know, those things are, are now the new normal and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And with that comes data and threats and, you know, we see it happen every single day. People getting attacked, and not only from the insider, you know, people, right. people still uh, believe that, you know, that sometimes their data is their data, and so they want to take it, and then other times, you know, obviously, they're, mm -hmm. they're getting phishing emails and things like that still, and we still see that a lot. Millions yes. of them, which is absolutely crazy. Y'all just published a threat report with some really exciting data that I've been chewing on this mm -hmm. afternoon. Can you give us some of the highlights? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're seeing just AI growth like crazy. I think everyone is. Madness. Yeah, yeah it's just all 28 over. billion I read yeah. in the report. It's been invested in the last four years. Yeah. That is a metric, I'm not gonna swear, but large ton of capital that, Lots. that's yes. going in there. Yeah, and, yeah. and most companies making that investment. Yeah. What else? Do they know what to do with it? Where, what's so I think right now we're still very early into it. So a lot of yeah. it is R&D projects. This is the first year that we're actually seeing the investment of money go into you know the, the corporate side. So right. everyone has projects now. Mm -hmm. Last year was playing around. This year is actually projects. Let's take this AI and let's use it, mm -hmm. right? And so we're seeing that that just expansion of the ecosystem that's meeting that demand as all these projects now are starting to get kicked off inside of these organizations. And so with that, people are trying to figure out what do we do with this data? How do we right. handle it? How do we leverage it? How do we leverage the services? How do we do these new things mm -hmm. that are really supposed to unlock? A, a couple of years ago, I remember doing some research um, and I had a talk on it, and it was, well, where are we going as a, as a world? Where are we going? And it was autonomous business. <laughs> Not bold at all. That's yeah. really quite, yeah. yeah. It was like, the meaning of life? how do we where get there? We yeah. yeah, and it was like, well, well business is going to be autonomous. Autonomous mm -hmm. business. And AI is Ooh. a key factor in getting to the autonomous business. So how I do we get there? I thought about that. Yeah, so it's like, how, how does it operate in that way? Um, and so we're just starting to see just the tip of it. It's just just picking up. You know, and it's exciting. It's exciting to be part of. I, I hope I look back in, in 10 years and say, wow. Like, I remember the first time I saw Google search, and I was like, holy cow, that's amazing. You brought something up when we were chatting on that point that I really loved is we've We've been here before. Yeah. We've, 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 you know, you and I are both longtime technologists and sports fans, as it turns out, <laughs> and we've seen, we've seen a number of hype curves. Yeah. Where do you think, and I know you're mentioning early, but how early are we on that adoption curve? Because I feel like some, like look at the market this week, yeah. for example. There's a bit of a fallout happening. Yeah. Investment, realizing gains, we're, we're in that delta right now, which is to be expected, to your point, because yeah. it's R&D. But I'm very curious where you think we are exactly on kind of that hype cycle. I think we're starting to see, and I don't want to use like the hype cycle terminology, but it's, it's easy to do. But I think it's easy for us to start to say that we're just starting to see the opportunities that we can, that we can take advantage of or we can start to leverage. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing vendor pitches and organizations come to me and say, look what we can do. Look at what I can put together for you, and right now you have to use an analyst to do this. Um, you know, before you had to do this all by hand, and you had to throw team members at it or projects at it, not just one analyst at it. And now we're starting to see where this can actually just come out of the box, and it can start to, you know, do things for you. Right. Um, which is really exciting. That's it amazing. Is. We've we've counted even, you know, going back on the order the the orchestration side. Uh, one of our projects that we did internally, right? Which you'd say, why are you talking about orchestration? Well, it all kind of fits together because once you can start to orchestrate and you have those connections, then you can start to let AI reuse those same connections and you can start to do things. But we've had dozens of FTE savings time. Now, this isn't FTE that you would say, well, I'm going to go hire someone for. This is mm -hmm. FTE of wasted time. Right, getting right? that time back. Getting the time back so you yeah. can respond faster. We're always trying to respond to a threat faster. Right, well, and be on the offense versus the reactionary defense. Exactly, so how do you get there? Yeah. Well, you have to build these data pipelines. You have to start to have this data in areas where you can actually get to it. You have mm -hmm. to be able to start having all your automations in place. I still even say, you gotta know what you're gonna automate. You still gotta know what you're gonna apply AI to. So we're right at that early stage still, where especially Gen AI. I think ML, AI, 
been around for a while. 20, 30 years. Yeah. Right. This isn't new. This it's, isn't new on that it's side. It's the application thereof. And and honestly, the ubiquitous adoption, right? Your data says mm -hmm. something like 98% of companies are yep. investing in They're AI investing, right yeah. now, which which tells me there's, there's only more capital coming into the space. I'm curious, given your lens and you're looking across industries, where are you seeing traction happen mm -hmm. fastest in these R&D projects? Yeah. Um, I think the first one that everyone looked at was how do I save time or money? Mm -hmm. How do I optimize? And I think there was an easy reason for CISOs to say yes to that mm -hmm. because usually it was corporate data and corporate information, right. right? We weren't getting into, well, now I'm handling customer data, right? And yeah, so I think that was a little sensitive. bit easier. Yeah, way more sensitive. And so even for us internally, a really it was much point. easier for us to go, oh, we want to yeah. optimize alert information mm -hmm. and try to auto triage those. Well, that's alert information. That's our that's a server that's speaking out saying, "Hey, I'm high on CPU's process right now," or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with customer data. Those are very easy for us to take on and for us to also realize and understand and let our AI labs team also understand the uses there. Um, at the same time, when we were internal, the one thing that we started building out ourselves was our AI governance. We started AI governance program three years ago internally. How hot is that right now? And now it's huge. I bet that's a I'm money maker for you. But yeah. No, I mean. Well, well I'm just trying to share it open source. I'm just trying to give it away to other folks. I talk to other CISOs. I'm like, where are you at? Even what are better. you doing? Because you know, this isn't something for us as a core that we're going to go sell as a service, as a something like that. I, I just want everyone to be able to understand it so then they can govern themselves and they can adopt it better and faster. I think faster. we all have better AI and yeah. we can have better systems and you can be a better service yeah. provider. Then we don't have the craziness also that yeah. you, know, you have a massive AI breach but right. then it stifles the industry. It hurts us. Of course. Which is the other thing that happens if you if you don't have those guardrails in place. Mm -hmm. That's the other part of it. So um, I think there's a, another part. Uh, we were talking earlier, and I forgot to mention this. Um, but I think organizations and CISOs have to understand, are you a creator? Or are you going to just be an adopter and a user? And I think there's different landscapes and different lenses you have to look at your program and understand that piece in. If you're going to be yeah. a creator, you have to have different guardrails in place and you have to approach the problem differently than, than being a technology consumer and using it for, for another type of benefit. I love that nuance. So how do you, would, uh, I can imagine there's a lot involved in the process of a company even establishing if they are a creator or a consumer. I think a lot of people want to be creators, but it's not always the best move for a company. Right. What percentage of folks do you find in both of those camps? How are you coaching them through that? What are those conversations like? Um, so it's hard, to, it's hard to give a percentage. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks feel that they have uh, creator groups. And it's still early because the technology is still rapidly developing. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, if I would ask six months ago how many people have a project that is trying to create your own LLMs, um, it was no one. I was going to say meta, maybe. Right. <laughs> like, there was know? no yeah. one that was doing it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, now you hear people talking about, and even in our own governance, we saw this happen really rapidly where it was, well, I want to use a service. Now I want to use an LLM. Now I want to use an SLM. Now I want to train it. Now I want to build my own. And it rapidly changed. And that happened, like my governance program couldn't even keep up with it. I was, I was oh, wow. just trying to keep up with that so I could give good guidance to the teams. Right. And rapidly going through over and over and over. That was, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, exciting at the end of the day, right? Yeah. You're like, wow, well, this is a creation. We're moving so fast. Yeah. Innovation is moving so yeah. fast. No, but a lot, of, a lot of companies haven't started to think about it from that side. And mm -hmm. so I, I would say if you're not thinking about it and you're really not looking at it from that side, you're probably a consumer. Um, if you're not being challenged by your groups of how to create mm -hmm. your own AI and your own gen AI, not just use something and put it into your product set, then you're probably more a consumer. Um, and then you just got to look for the shadow and you got to look for those guardrails that are in place where data is moving. Yeah. Uh, where if you're a creator, then you have to start really understanding some of the privacy laws. Where is the, where is the regulatory landscape headed? Way more cognitive load to yeah. a degree in yeah. that regard across your development team and everybody else. Yeah. No, yeah. it's a lot more. I, I I love that we were chatting about it before we went live today, talking about these threat reports. And we get hit with them as journalists all the yeah. time, like I was telling you. And I love it. I mean, I love chewing up the data. But I'm curious because there's a lot of them that go out. What's your advice for folks on how to use these? It's tough. Um, so when I was an analyst, I used to read through every single one, have every single right. line detailed, highlighted. Mm -hmm. you know, I knew it. Uh, you know, then change, gonna get into leadership a little more. Now I needed to be synthesized a little bit more. Then get mm -hmm. into CISO role. Now I'm like, give me the, give me the point. Right. And a lot of times I'll look at these reports, and this is what I advise others on: look at the report, understand it, drive conversation with your peers. 
see where your peers are at on the position, just like you're saying, hey, how many of you right. are looking at it being a consumer versus a creator, right. Right. right? Have those conversations and drive it out with the data points behind it, mm -hmm. right? And then that basically can then set, set a better stage for you strategically, mm -hmm. for you to have a conversation and then give better counsel and advice to your organization and your other leaders. Um, whereas before, you know, when I'd look at every single point, I'd say, oh, I need to go and I need to look for a tactic because 78% of the time something's happening. Right. So I'm going to go internally, I'm going to dig into so the data. So it's more about umbrella scope of what's yeah. the state of the landscape, how can we evaluate our yeah. potential risks and vulnerabilities yep. and make sure that we're providing the best service. Well, use it almost as a, another form of intel. Yeah. You know, where's the market heading, let's just say. Yeah. Right? Well, where trends. is the industry and the trends heading? And do I need to start pivoting my program and look at it? It's very difficult when you say, okay, here's what we're going to do in a year, here's what we're going to do in three years mm -hmm. to pivot your program midway through. But if you look out and you have those conversations with some of your peers, then you're able to say, okay, I need to start shifting my program this way because this is either something that's a strategic you know, kind of guideline yeah. that I'm going to have to follow or this is something tactical that just is going to show up right now and it's going to be a problem. Uh, so you can you can start to shape it yeah. internally. We start looking at the the very specific attacks and threats and those types of things. Bring those in and then say, okay, do we have the capabilities to recreate these? Right. Obviously, yeah. because on a team, I need that capability. But where is it going? Well, we know there's going to be continued threats and attacks. So how do we also build our program to be able to be counter counterintuitive to those or or to take a look at those and say, okay, we need to be responsive. I need to be on this. I need to have my pulse of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, it's like a control market. plane pulse, yeah, essentially, of the exactly. industry, which is really important. That single plane of observability, even just on the industry, I think is really vital. So yep. makes perfect sense. You also did something interesting in this threat report. You had a special section for CISOs. Yeah. And it's the first time, yeah? It was the first time. Tell yeah. me about that. Yeah, well, we were having a conversation. Uh, Ray, who, who uh, writes the report, we were having a, a conversation. I think it was at RSA, and he said, you know, we, we have a threat report that we're building. We'd love to get a CISO perspective. And I was like, this is a perspective. Why would you want that in a threat report? He said, you know, because sometimes I don't know, like, really am I hitting the mark for that type of audience or for a leadership type yeah. of audience. Yeah, yeah, And so that was what we did in this one was we actually built that section out. We said, hey, inside of this threat report, let's, let's try to bubble it up a little bit. Let's try to give some guidance on how should you use the report. And why how not? Should you to your look point, at you don't have to read it like a research analyst. Exactly. Why not give the tone of education and advice? Or even I gave, like, a, a little bit of a flip side to it. So I gave kind Ooh. of a little bit of like a, d don't even worry about the like content of it. Like almost the counter perspective. The counter perspective of yeah, it, right? Yeah, Which yeah. was if you're, if you're not able to read through this and you just hit that one point, think about it like this, right? Mm -hmm. And think about kind of where things are headed and again, use it, talk to peers, talk to, your, talk to others. You know, if you're not able to read this, give this report to your team, let them read it, give you kind of the, the roll up report of it or, or yeah. you know, some high notes that, they, that you should follow. But other than that, you know, if you hit that part as a leader, you know, it can give you a different, kind of a whole different perspective on, on what was written in there. No, yeah. I think that's great. Well, yeah. and it helps with the digestion yeah. of all of that information, which I think is really imperative, especially right now with the amount of input we all receive. Yeah, well, that's the problem with the threat reports. Right. right. It's, just a, it's, it's so much, it can be so much information that comes in, you almost What's have to relevant? have a team. Exactly. You know, how do I discern this? No, I think it's really great that y'all are doing that, and I'm honestly not surprised. Last question for you, because we could talk all day, yeah. and I know it's a busy week for you. What do you hope, because you've been a fabulous guest, what do you hope to be able to say the next time we're at Black Hat, sitting down chatting, that you can't yet say today? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I would hope that we don't have a major breach inside of an AI system that holds us back. I think that the technology Love is that. is uh, so amazing, and I think it's very important to for us to understand and adopt the technology within the US, within the world. Um, and you can see even how different countries, you know, the, the, the reports on how they're using AI differently than, than even the U.S. and such. And I think that um, if we have a major setback, that's going to be a big problem. So I hope that, you know, different security programs and security leaders are, are able, and, and honestly, businesses are listening to their CISOs and saying, you know, help me to get to here. Right, right. And, and bringing the CISO along with that. Because if not, and we do have a major setback, it's a setback for the entire industry. And that's what I worry. And then what you start to see is you start to see the tailing regulations that are gonna come in that then are gonna basically hold back the, the technology in the industry as well. So that's yeah. the biggest thing that I hope that, you know, if we get to do this again next year. We will. Uh, we, we, we don't have one of those things that that's what we're discussing. Because I think that will be really, really bad for kind of everything and, and the, really the opportunity of the technology. Um, and that goes for any technology, right? If, if, if you can point. adopt it and you can understand it and, and allow it to you know, take place with some guardrails, there's definitely guardrails you need, but of course. you don't have to hold it back. 
You know, so. Yeah. No, I think I really love that point. I love that you're essentially saying you hope there isn't some sort of catastrophe that's detrimental to the overall technological movement that's happening yeah. right here because it's going to be largely beneficial. It's going to be huge for decades. For all of us. Yeah. I think you're our only guest from Indianapolis this uh, week. Is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to in Indy today? Oh, my family, by yes. far. So uh, they're uh, starting high school this week. <gasps> so Huge! I got two in high school. Oh my God, congrats, yeah, Dad. So that's a big, that's yeah. a big deal. So, um, but uh, we used to always come out. Uh, so a uh, little, little inside, my, uh, my wife and I have our anniversary right around this time. And so we used to always spend it here. And my wife is in cybersecurity as well. That's where we met. And so uh, Wow, for well us, done, mate. Well yeah, done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we used to always come out here and do our anniversary out here, which is a little weird. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not that, I mean, it can be fun. It was fun. Great shows, great food. Yeah. You know, it's not all the debauchery. Yeah, you know, add, a, add a week into it. So yeah, yeah. Definitely want to say that. And then, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great CISO community and, and security community within Indy. It's uh, you know, only, a, only a million or so people there, but we have a really good community, so I want to say hello to all of them. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it. A happy anniversary, oh, James, thank you. Yeah. to you and your wife and the fam. Congrats to the kids. It's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh, what a, what a big week. And, yeah, wow, what fun. And, and cheers to the indie community. I'm a big fan of smaller communities. I live in the Silicon Valley, but my family's from Minnesota. Oh, yeah. So I've got a little bit of a Midwest bias you and do. soft spot for sure. And, and, and always want to make sure those communities know they're elevated and cared yeah, about. Don't fly over. Yeah, Stop on through. Ex that's the spirit, James. Thank you so much for being here yeah, on the show with here. us. Thank this you. is absolutely fantastic. And thank all of you for tuning in to our fantastic two days of coverage here at Black Hat in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, the leading source for cybersecurity news.